Um, we're, we're just uh, settling in and getting ready to start. I had one other question I forgot to ask you, which is, have you bridged to the other school? Are they online? Did you hear anything more from Luis? And on this side of the room, oh, too bad. Okay. Is somebody connected in internet? That may be Luis. I don't know, but uh, that would be it. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, we're just uh, settling in and getting started. Um, what I would like to do is uh, introduce our guest for this evening, Alejandro Natal, to the class. And Alejandro, you'll get a chance to see uh, who's here, and we'll do a, a quick sweep of the class so that people will have a chance to introduce themselves to you. Um, they haven't been warned. <laughs> this will give them a chance to use the technology because we'll use that for cues and questions and answers later on. So um, I'm going to uh, briefly invite the class to introduce themselves, and then I will introduce you briefly, and then we'll pass to you. And uh, if you can uh, introduce uh, Carlos as well, that would be great. Um, so I'm going to turn this first to the class and ask people uh, if uh, perhaps uh, starting uh, with you, um, if you could introduce yourselves and just say very briefly what your interest is in civil society. Um, hi, I'm Christine. Um, this is the first time I've taken a public administration class, so I'm just sort of getting my feet wet in terms of civil society and education. And you're studying journalism. journalism. Uh, hi, my name's Judy, and uh, this is also one of my first exposure to CSOs, and I'm just interested in learning more about it, and I'm studying international development. Hello, my name is Daniel, and uh, I am in international affairs, and uh, Yes, you do. Yeah. Press the button for the mic. You could start again. <laughs> they have their mic. Oh, did you? Hi. So, I'm Dania, and I'm in international affairs, um, and I'm interested in transnational movements um, and awareness-based uh, civil society organizations. Uh, my name is Ali Sayed. I, uh, studying international development in my first year here. Um, I did some work for uh, uh, the UNDP in Lebanon and some uh, civil society organizations over there as well. And uh, that's where my interest in uh, the third sector is national. My name is, hi, my name is Edward Garber, and I'm a second year student in international development at the School of Public Policy. I'm here to learn a lot about civil society organizations and their capacity to influence policy and, and to impact on development. So I thought this course is very, very important and I'm here to learn a lot about civil society and their role in influencing policy and impacting on development. Thank you. Uh, hi. Can be a little bit. So, I'm going to change students from from the Hello, good evening. My name is Anne and I am in the development stream of the um, of the policy and the demonstration program. And my interest is in civil society and building, how do we continue to build capacity of um, civil society organizations and keep their input in public policy development. I spent a lot of time in uh, working at that, an NGO with a community of organizations in so that's my interest. Hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm also a first year student in the development stream uh, at the School of Public Policy, and I'm interested in civil society organizations that focus on women in development. 
Claudia Vangela, and I'm uh, also a master's student in public policy. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on international development. <laughs> um, and I'm especially interested in NGOs in authoritarian space and the advocacy network um, addressing Okay, Th this is this is the class. I don't know how clearly you heard everyone, Alejandro. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, well, um, I'm just going to say a few words of introduction, and then I'll let you say what you'd really like the students to hear. Um, but uh, for uh, those who, who don't know Alejandro, he is the program director of uh, an interdisciplinary program at the El Colegio Mexicense for third sector studies. Um, the college is a partner with Carleton and four other universities in Canada and the US uh, for a student exchange program called the Trilateral Exchange Program and is interested in providing opportunities for students like yourself who have interest in third sector studies or civil society studies uh, to learn firsthand what's going on in one of the three countries. Um, Alejandro uh, did a PhD in um, development studies at the London School of Economics. Uh, he's been um, a very active and engaged researcher in Mexico and involved uh, firsthand with a number of uh, important civil society movements, has spent a lot of time uh, uh, researching and uh, deepening our understanding of how uh, the sector has really played an important role in deepening democracy in Mexico, which I think is a really interesting issue for us to be looking at as well. Um, what else do we need to know about you, or should we know about you, Alejandro, and your current interests? Some research on organizations that are promoting development, civil society organizations promoting development in Mexico. And uh, thank you very much for, for, for the presentation, for the class to be here with that weather. Here, Iker, you just used to know we are 20 degrees, uh, so it's a beautiful day here. So I'm sorry we cannot send some sunshine from here, but um. okay. Well, uh, I think you have the slides there. Is that correct? Okay, so everybody can, can can see. Well, what I'm going to talk to you now. Um, this afternoon is about the evolution of Mexican civil society. And as Barbara said, uh, my presentation is focused on the long quest for democracy that Mexican civil society had. Um, well, um, let me start um, by talking about, in, in this slide number two, uh, you can see that I introduced this slide with the term decorporativismo, which uh, I have to explain a little bit on this and let me just go around a bit because it's very important and I will be going to this again and again. Um, the Mexican corporativist system was a form of government that understood that government was exercised, government and power was exercised in an organic way, so to say. It was a way of reorganizing the fight for power after the Mexican Revolution. You have to remember that the Mexican Revolution was a very complicated process that took us a long time of, uh, of uh, between 1910 and 1929. Um, and there were many groups fighting in throughout all the countries. So as a mechanism to deal with the fight for power, was created this system that I'm going to try to explain now. As I said, corporativism is a form of government that understands government as an organic, as an, as an organism. You, you have to think that corporativism in Spanish means something totally different from English. In English, the word corporation is kind of a business, right? Uh, in Spanish, the word corpus, which is the Latin word for body, uh, implies this organic perspective. Things work as a body. And um, that, that was the way that the 
regional leaders that after the revolution designed this model of government tried to do to make the whole country work as the same body. But once I say that the world has no parallel in English, there, there are three things that are similar to the word in English, which is corporations have a hierarchy, right? So, so a body have a mind that governs the body, uh, and this political system also had the idea of a strong hierarchy of different departments or sectors that controlled different resources and were in charge of doing a specific tasks. And the idea was that all the actors, all the, sex, the sectors, had to work for the government with the same ideal. Corporativism had three legs that I put there as a way of a flag you will see in the, in the slides. These three legs were, first, the construction of sector identities. The government created a strong national culture and then created sub-identities where all citizens have to be identified. And needs of the different sectors were attended by the government through each sector. There were four sectors, peasants, the private sector, the popular sector, and unions or workers' sector. Sectors were then given the control, this is the other leg of, of, of the system, were given the control of a specific assets, of a specific resources they could actually use as their own patrimony. They, they could exploit them, like say oil, or they could control the, the prices, electricity, and of course this implied a lot of corruption involved in the system. And Alan Reading said one day about the Mexican system, the cooperative system, that corruption was the oil that make the machine work. Uh, and indeed, it was a leg uh, that, that, that allowed the system to, to operate. All these resources were, were given to these different sectors in exchange of their loyalty, in exchange of their membership being, peace, being peaceful and obey the government. The demands were attended also through this sector's uh, system in what you surely know as clientelism. Okay, well, that's for corporativism. All this was reinforced by a strong cultural identity that was uh, created through a national, uh, nationalist project of what means to be Mexican. And, uh, for those of you that have come to Mexico, then, then was, were created all our oh. national heroes and stuff. But also, is, is everything okay? Uh, the connection dropped for a while, so we lost a few oh. words that you were saying. Okay. It froze. Okay. Except we had you, Alejandro, just up until the end of the, the slide. So if you're moving to the next slide. Okay, well, let me just finish by saying that uh, in, in, the, in this slide number, number two, okay? In slide yeah. number two, uh, uh, what I said is all this was reinforced by a, a nationalist project and a very strong educative program that said what it meant to be Mexican. Okay. But as you can imagine, the state was a very powerful and controlling state. The state controlled all political interests, all economic activities, but also, and this is very important for us tonight, all social action. It controlled all, not only controlled, but organized all the spaces for public opinion, all forms of public expression, the mechanisms through which society expressed their voice, but, even, but also the topics and the places where people could talk. Of course, we are here talking about a very authoritarian regime. Uh, you can imagine that in this state of, of affairs, there were 
some leaders still, some social leaders that try to change the system like everywhere else. Well, yes, but as you see there in this slide, I say there was a very active uh, mechanism of leader co cooptation. The, the government even had a, a the whole office for co-opting leaders, social leaders, and put them in the political stair. Uh, if this didn't work, then they passed to corrupting them, bribe them to, to make them do what the government wanted. And if this didn't work, then they went for repression, which the gover these governments, on, during all these years, uh, I'm, I'm talking between 1929 and uh, 2000, didn't have a problem of exert repression. Slide number four show a kind of a synthesis of what I'm saying. And um, leaders of society had in charge the control of their membership. And they were recognized by the government by attending the needs of their leadership, of, of their membership, sorry. And by so doing, what we have is the agendas, the social agendas were conditioned, and this is very important, to the political agenda. Uh, also, what you, can, what, what you have all, or, already surely imagined, all citizens' organizations were part of this body where the government that the government direct, and all then all civic organizations were corporativized in the way that corporativism uh, is. And, of, and the leadership, the social entrepreneurs were preempted and were made to serve the government's interests. Therefore, what we have here is a an state where social action is framed by the state, where civil society capacities to propose some public discussion is kidnapped and a system that was really, really, really uh, doing this even in the 80s. I mean, the system ended in the 2000 and we are going to talk that afterwards, but, but the system was there working, as I said, even throughout the 80s which is very recently, um, well, not for many of you, but for me, it was part of my life. Um, anyway, we cannot think that the government actually could control every single thing, every single possible social form of organization throughout the country. And yes, there were some germs of change. There were some cells of society that started to, to make a change, even in the 50s, when there was plenty of resources in this so-called Mexican miracle, was huge economic growth in Mexico. And even at that time, there were some, uh, what in Spanish are called, comunidades eclesiales de base, which are uh, church uh, sponsored pastoral organizations that work in small communities and had a, a missionary action, yes, but also have, you have to remember that these were the years of the theology of the liberation, so th they, all re they also had a very social uh, component and participants were, yes, being involved in Catholic values, but also had, had an experience of organization that they couldn't have anywhere else. And since the church was the only single actor capable of organizing public action without the state, the church became, the Catholic church, became very, very, very important in Mexico and many organizations and a number, a vast number of, uh, of leaders of organizations in Mexico have an origin in these uh, church organizations of the time, mainly the Jesuits. We had also some left organizations uh, in, in the country. Um, these had low visibility and were dispersed throughout the country. Uh, some of them created later guerrilla movements. 
and um, had not a real impact, but were very important in terms of opening up public opinion and making uh, uh, the general public aware of a number of uh, political demands, lack of democracy, and so on and so forth. And there were also some what I call shy social movements in the 50s, unions demand uh, that started to originate as Mexico started to industrialize more and more. There were more and more movements, uh, train, railroad workers, um, doctors, teachers, and so on. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going fast throughout the history because I cannot go into every single thing, but if you later on want to deepen in one particular issue, I can do that for you. Um, in the 1960s, we have, as everywhere else, there was a worldwide movement. I mean, in transparency number six. Sorry about that, Barbara. Um, I, 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 I just saw in, in, into the presentation that I forgot to say the, the transparency number. But I'm in transparency six. And yes, in the 60s, you have a worldwide movement of students. It happened in Paris, it happened in Mexico, it happened in the States, it surely happened in Canada. And we have a new generation coming into power. And these students, they say, in, in the Paris they used to say, we have to bring imagination to power. We have to change the world. This is the hippies starting. And um, it's not only huge flowers in the in, in, in the clothes and the hats and stuff, <laughs> but also is the idea that we needed a better world, a more fair world, and um, in Mexico this was very a very interesting period because it had it coincided with the growing of urban population after the Mexican miracle after after the economic growth. We had a large urban population, a large uh, urban middle class, but also, as you can imagine from what I've been saying, social unrest had slowly and slowly started to grow. And there were a number of demands against the lack of freedom uh, for more democracy in these urban middle classes. So in the 68, these students just 11 days before the, the Mexican Olympics of 68, these students had a massive demonstration in the city. And since the government became very frightened that this uh, mo students' mobilization could continue into the Olympics, they repressed them with tanks and all the military forces of the government and killed hundreds of them. And this is known in Mexico as the 68, which is uh, a very, very uh, sad moment in the history of Mexico, but was the first major crack in the system, in the corporativist system. That very day, the system started to collapse, slowly but slowly, but it started to collapse, because these students were part of this urban middle class, were par the parents were part of the sectors I was, was talking about before. So they started to, the people started to think that a government that could repress students in this fierce manner could not be a good government. Slide number seven then shows that the 70s are characterized in Mexico by, an, by a number of NGOs and community-based organizations, or CBOs, that are formed by the influence of the students' movement of the 60s. This organization grew at the margin of corporativism, had low visibility, and of course didn't want to have a major profile. They worked with people in shanty towns, in remote communities. They tried to maintain themselves as invisible as possible. And they work in areas as democratic change, equity, diversity, uh, ethnic rights, housing, women's rights, and so on. Slide number seven, uh, number eight, sorry, goes to the 80s. And what I try to explain there is uh, just four major events. The first is 
uh, in the 80s, uh, in Mexico was tried to set, well, was actually set, the first nuclear plant. And of course, this generated a major environmental movement in which particularly focused in a movement called Laguna Verde, which is Green Lagoon, which is the place, a beautiful place in the, in the Gulf of Mexico that was actually destroyed by the construction of the nuclear plant. This, uh, well, it says movement, but, but actually it's a movement. On, it's an anti-nuclear <laughs> movement, no, no, not, not little movement. But, um, but Laguna Verde was important because for the first time it brought environmentalists. Environmentalists was, was right for the government. It has not political demands, so it was actually good for, for, for the government to see that some students going into, into, into the environment movement. But, but soon the environmental movement started to network with people in, in remote areas like Tabasco that you must have heard was uh, floated very recently, where, where the major oil industry, which is Pemex, had this, this uh, uh, was polluting for, for, a, for, for, for a time. Um, the, these environmental movements serve also to create another movement, which in the 80s was the uh, movement against the reform of Mexico City. Mexico City had major reforms in the 70s, and, but up mainly in the 80s, uh, that destroyed houses, parks, and stuff to create uh, major highways and make the city more livable. So. Uh, what we see is that these people in urban areas all, uh, network and make alliances with people in rural areas and that the whole environmentalist movement started to, to get together and to see that a l important part of the problem was the lack of expression of the public opinion was also the lack of democracy in the, in, in the sense that the public interests were not considered by the politicians when they took decisions, and so on, on and so forth. By 85, we have this movement, this movement being very important in Mexico and very influential already, and had conquered spaces that no other social movement has conquered before. But there was event, an event in September of, nine, of 1985, which were the two major earthquakes that practically destroyed Mexico City. Mexico City was devastated, communications were interrupted, bridges collapsed, and half of the city was in ruins. Of course, you can imagine that there were millions of uh, people displaced, homeless, disappeared. It was an absolute Chaos. But this, the size of the chaos and the size of the earthquakes can only be <coughs> compared with the incapacity of government to actually react. Of course, these were major events, and it's very difficult for, for, for any government to react when there are no enough streets uh, where, where cars and, uh, can circulate, and there are no communications, and there is no way to talk to the people. So, but the important thing here is the government was silent, absolute silent for, for a couple of days. They could, their structures, the corporative structures didn't work. So when people saw how they were to find the death, uh, save somebody that is under the ruins, they could not turn to the government that used to be the all providing father but they had to provide to their neighbors, to other people in their community. And then people in their community start to organize themselves without not many options, without not thinking that much about that. But people started to solve and organizing themselves to solve their problems. And this for Mexicans was, and we are talking about the 80s, these are the first forms of public organizations that actually appear in Mexico. And of course, you are going to think that this is very late. 
And yes, you're right. That's one explanation of why Mexican civil society is still an infant in terms of maybe other countries. But the important thing is, yes, it's the first time that people was organized, but organization also gave them an experience of achievement. And more interesting, people could bring their traditional structures. In Mexico, people organize for, for parties, for the patron saint of, of the community, for a lot of festivities that we have in, related with Catholic values. You should come over so you can see that. But we, we have a lot of parties all the time. So we brought that structures into civil society and they match perfectly. This is, this is something very interesting. And yes, of course, you, you can compare this with what Putnam says about uh, you know, choral groups and football uh, teams in Italy. Uh, you may find some, some interesting parallels. Well, slide number nine. Uh, presents another event of the 80s. And I say that if we have in 85 the earthquakes, we also have um, the continuation of this fracture of corporativism. And by the 70s, corporativism had started to fail. Unions had demands for democratization, for more professionalization of, of, of workers, uh, they, some unions started to increase their bargaining vis-a-vis -vis the government. Some didn't want to do it through the sector, but by their own way. And um, we had a major fight between government and some business chambers. And what we were seeing by the 70s was that there were some problems with the sectors. But by the 80s, the economic crisis, and then the, you, you, some of you should know that by 1982 we had this um, major economic crisis in Mexico, and Mexico stopped paying their debt uh, uh, royalties, and that meant that the, the peso uh, was devaluated, and that we went into then later this very very stringent and draconian structural adjustment that actually inhibited the government to continue giving resources to specific groups, uh, reducing the capacity of government to bribe uh, and reward uh, loyal leaders, and make, because it was one of the demands of, of IMF, uh, make the government to curve down corruption and to have some measures to curve down corruption, which, as I said, was one of the legs of the corporativist system. Uh, but then if you take out the rewards that the government could give to, to loyal uh, members, the incapacity of, 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 of government to, um, to reward uh, leaders, what you have is a system that is not open, op, operating anymore. And if you add to this what I said in the previous slide, which is that the society had already learned to organize itself parallel to the government, then we have a final collapse of the corporativist system. However, we had the system uh, is dying and dying and dying. There was a dead that wanted to recognize that was dead until the 2000s. So 20 years more, we had still the corporativism given its last uh, breaths. By the 90s, uh, trans, uh, slide number 10, please, uh, economic crisis uh, continue reducing the legitimacy of the system. And why I say that the economic crisis reduces the legitimacy of the system? Because um, it showed that the state was not only the best provider, but show also that the government was not only the only provider. And it also reduced the legitimacy of the system in political, term, in, in political terms because it shows that uh, the state could not control all political interests and could not provide for all 
the uh, necessity of power of different groups and sectors. Furthermore, some unions separate for, from the corporativist system, business chambers, most of them separate from the corporativism, and in 1994, there were a very, very important law for Mexico. The government tried to uh, give a boost to the uh, agricultural production, and then it changed the ejido. The ejido was a cultural type of property um, which was central to the Mexican Revolution. Uh, if any of you want to know more, of course, I, recommend, I can recommend a number of books. But there is also a very interesting film uh, where you can see Zapata, which was one of these indigenous leaders that fought for the land. And there you can see how land was very, very, very into the mind of, of the leaders that made the revolution to distribute the land. Remember that before we had these old huge haciendas and peasants came to fight for a piece of land. And uh, Mexico then had an a, a agricultural reform that gave every, theoretically, every peasant a piece of land. And, um, but then the, in the 1994, this, this was reversed, and now uh, land was not collective anymore, but was again private, and peasants could sell their land. This by many, many, many people, mainly those that have been taught and educated through this corporative system, meant that the government had betrayed the revolution. Uh, there was, after all this, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to finish. I've been talking for, for quite a bit now. Um, this uh, state of, of affairs gave the government no more control over people, no more control over the economy, and very little control over political affairs. So the government tried to resurrect their leadership through a program called Solidaridad. Solidaridad, or solidarity, it, it, it was a program oriented to poor people and it tried to rebuild the social base for the government. It was a program based in participatory issues and uh, as many of you that are working in development know, it tried to make the poor actors of their own development. Unfortunately, since the program have a very important political component, the, the, the program didn't work. Uh, slide number 11 shows another important moment in Mexican history, which is the entrance of Mexico to NAFTA, um, in Spanish called uh, Telecan. But NAFTA means, meant uh, for civil society to rethink what meant globalization at the local level. And there were a number of, of organizations like uh, Red Mexicana de Acción Contra el Libre Comercio that network with American and Canadian um, environmental mainly uh, organizations but also labor organizations. And their lobby actually ended with the creation of the so-called parallel agreements. So if you actually think in NAFTA, you should also think of a very important trinational cooperation between civil society organizations, which was very successful in include two issues that were not there before. One, uh, considerations for the environment, even there is an environmental court of justice, so to say, where mm, Mexican organizations can bring Mexican government to court in terms of environment and things like that. So, so I can go into that if some of you want. But this experience make that some uh, organizations in Mexico, mainly this remark that is in the slide, could later be the leader of another very similar movement, but now in the region of Latin America, that is against the FTTA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas that you must be aware of, and that uh, is now being discussed by many of our governments. 
So this is part of the opposition, the civil society opposition to regional integration. Um, then we have in 1994 also, at the same day that the NAFTA started, we have the appearance of the Zapatist army uh, for the national liberation, which is most known as the Zapatistas. And the Zapatistas have been a very interesting social movement. I'm not going to go much into that because I'm sure you have far more information than anything else. And if some of you want to, want to talk about later on, we can do on that. But uh, the only thing I can say is that the, the Zapatistas link the long struggle of democracy, the civil society struggle for democracy, to the reflection that democracy had to also be part of a more fair development with more social justice. And uh, this was a, a very important element that was brought into the discussion of democracy in Mexico and still is around. Slide number 12. Uh, shows another important uh, part of the uh, history of Mexican civil society. And here I talk about uh, four networks that were created between 90, 1994 and 1995, which were Alianza Cívica, Convergencia, Ugama, and Poder. Two are important for us here. And one is Alianza Cívica, which actually uh, managed, and it's, it's a fantastic organization that managed in a couple of days to have representatives throughout all the country and 30 chapters in all the states of Mexico. And in 1995, Alianza Civica managed to have at least one representative in every single voting point. Sorry, I don't, I don't know how you sell this in English, but it's the place where you put the ballot. Uh, here we the, call it Casillo. The well, yeah, the place where you go to vote and put your ballot, this organization had an, a, a representative of the organization. This was illegal, I mean, but at least was a way of showing that society could organize and could monitor elections. They were not recognized as observants, but they were observing the elections. And this was in the, in the election of 1994 and 1995. Uh, Alianza Civica, by doing this action, ma created such a social effervence that a after that, the government had to recognize that elections could be monitored and observed and had to re engineer re to provide of a new form of organization to what in slide number 13 I show as the Instituto Federal Electoral, which is the National Bureau for Elections. So by the, nine, in, uh, the middle 90s, the National Bureau of Elections was reorganized and most people from Alianza Civica came into this bureau and there, those were the ones that organized the elections of 2000s. Uh, but but the, the, these networks also created the, the National Commission for Human Rights, and between these two institutions managed to actually be so influential that the process, the electoral process of 2000 was the first uh, free elections where every single ballot was counted in Mexico. That brought us to a, the end of the 72 years single party rule and to the first uh, elected government from opposition. Uh, this, of course, this new government, the slide number 14, uh, was really happy to work with the organizations a number of foundations appear, which, is, which means that private interests were happy to put money into uh, civil society causes. They were 
not anymore afraid that this money was going to be taken by, by some corporativist organizations. Many civil society leaders came into the government uh, to do some what I call non-governmental public action from the inside. Uh, and they were very happy to work with this new government. Some civil society organizations radicalized, most those to the left, and there were some mechanisms that I have called in, in, in some of what I've written a non-traditional politics, which were all these ways of doing politics through civil society organizations. Let me show you briefly a table where I, 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 I think if, if, if you uh, click in the, in the table, Barbara, uh, yep. Hyperlink, uh, you are there? I'm here. Yep. Okay. Well, th then you can see how in the 2000s um, there's a boom in organizations as never before in Mexico, and civil society showed this enormous uh, uh, potential and it started to, to go into every single area that you can imagine as every other modern country does. And... Um, as you can see, also foundations grew in these years and many other type of organizations. Going back to, 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 to slide number uh, 14, actually we can go to number 15 to, to go towards the end. Uh, we can start what after democracy in Mexico. And um, we have a number of challenges. Um, and with this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to conclude. First, there is still activists and donors know that there are still a number of uh, development issues uh, where activists need to influence more public policy. Uh, we have still to think about the sustainability of democracy because one thing is to have different governments from different parties, but other different thing is to have democracy with what Dow and O'Donnell and Shevorsky and other authors have called the quality of democracy. This is a democracy that serves all citizens as equals and that provides for all the same uh, type of services. We hope also to have a cultural change. As you can imagine, 72 years of corporativism gave Mexicans, many Mexicans, the idea that the government was the all-providing father. And this is the kind of culture that, needs, uh, that activists and donors need to, to change. Organizations need to learn a lot about management, as most of we need to, to know management. I, I, I said this to myself when, when I have my pay every, every month. So we all need to know about management. Uh, we all, Mexican organizations also need to learn more about how to become more organizations and stop being social movements. This is a complicated transit that has very interesting theoretical implications, I'm sure you have reviewed, but that uh, it's difficult for, for practitioners to actually learn, mainly in countries like Mexico that are new to democracy. Uh, but also these organizations have to learn the new tools of democracy to influence public policy. And um, finally, in, but, but the major issue is the issue of empowerment. Uh, at the end of the day, civil society organizations serve their beneficiaries. And if beneficiaries are not empowered, then all the work of these organizations for good and committed that this can be has to be questioned. If beneficiaries are not empowered, all the work of, organ of an organization is useless. And in the slide number 16, I say that I will very much appreciate your comments and your questions on, 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 on this uh, presentation that took quite a bit. I'm sorry about that. But, but, but I hope that I can be of, of, of some help to illustrate what is going on in, in the last years in Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, well, I'm going to speak for the class and say I don't think you need to uh, apologize. You covered a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, history and, and cultural change and uh, certainly uh, made it really come alive, I think, for all of us here. Um, I'm going to ask if there are questions in the room. And I'll, what I'll do is just to keep things moving, I'll note you, and uh, then we'll follow in order of your hands. Okay? So, Caitlin. First question. Hi. Um, and, and speak up so we can all hear. Okay. Um, after reading a few articles on civil society in Mexico, um, I read that, that traditionally during the corporatist era that the, the Catholic Church was pretty much the only entity that could exist more independently of the state. And I was just wondering if the Catholic Church still plays a, a big role in civil society or whether that has more paper off. Barbara, how should we do this? Yeah. Should we take a number of questions and then I ask all of them, and, or should we go one by one? What do you prefer? Well, let's see how many other uh, students want to ask a question. Okay. Yes. Okay. Are you off? Okay. Okay. Um, when we were speaking a few weeks ago about civil society organizations, the uh, question about uh, transparency on CSOs in Mexico um, came up, and that was something I couldn't answer, so I, I was uh, thinking if you could answer that. And the other thing that uh, came up was what happened with the um, uh, leaders of CSOs that went into the government thing. Fox administration, and um, the, the question was something about that it, this that it, this represented um, a lot of leaders for CSOs. So if you could cover something around it and, and um, talk a bit about the research you're doing on that, that would be very interesting. Thank you. And mm -hmm. you talked about the um, democratization and the space being opened up for um, trade unions, etc., and their bargain. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> My question is around uh, the democratization and the space of being opened, has been opened up for civil society organizations. Um, could you talk a little bit about the trade union bargaining rights and what's happening now? And what are, the, what are they bargaining for in terms of um, better working conditions and things like that? And, how, and what's that like now? Okay, let's take a break here, and uh, Alejandro, we'll pass to you. Well, I would need a couple of days to, to actually answer your, your, your questions, but I won't take, it won't take that long, don't, don't worry. Um, I'm, just, I'm just going to try to briefly comment on this. And um, first question, Catholic Church is just still playing a role, but it's not as central as before, since nowadays, uh, Mexicans can express freely and can organize without any problems and can create all types of, of organizations and activists are not any more uh, repressed or in jail by the government. Uh, the situation has to go to the other side of, of, of the pendulum. And uh, now it's the other way around. Now I would say that we Mexicans are um, fighting out what we couldn't fight before, so we are talking and talking and discussing and discussing and, you know, exercising our rights as we couldn't do before. And um, so we are like, I would say, like a teenager now. And uh, the, the, the church is not relevant uh, as such anymore. But it's still a number of organizations, so one said all, all this, a number of organizations are still related in a way or, no, or another to the church. 
and, and, and priests are still a major uh, source of uh, public action, mainly in communities. Um, so yes, uh, I would say that is, the church has not the major role, but it still has a role in civil society. About transparency, well, that, that's, that's a marvelous question, because when I said that it, we are like a teenager now, this is, is exact. So we are demanding for transparency, but most organizations are not transparent themselves. So they are not accountable to their donors, and they have problems of being accountable to their beneficiaries. And uh, so therefore, there, there is a lot of uh, Mexican organizations have to, to learn, still to learn, in terms of, of transparency and accountability. Uh, the other question on uh, activists that went into Mexican government uh, with, uh, after the democracy, uh, well, that's fascinating. And for those of you that could be more interested in this, I, I just recently uh, finished the Mexican part of an international study on activists that went into government and tried to create uh, some reforms, try to produce change within the government. So normally the role of activists is outside the government and what they do is try to influence the government. Well, what happened when activists cross into government? And um, for those of you that don't want to read the paper, I can give you the short answer. The short answer is, well, they were not of many use because they didn't produce the changes that we were needing. And the reason is because activists, well, there are many reasons, but the major reason is because activists are unconnected of many other political uh, uh, forces that are neither to create consensus about a cause. And uh, therefore, when they go into government, they are not either part of the bureaucracy, they disconnect from society, and they are like in the middle of everything, like loose. Uh, I don't know if you saw that the TV show called Lost in Space. Well, this is what, I, what happened to activists that go into government. As for trade unions now, this is another fantastic question, and I'm very happy that you uh, asked this. Um, trade unions now are also in the middle of two worlds two words, um, uh, they still are integrated in this sectorial uh, uh, um, type of organization, but at the same time, they don't have to be members of unions anymore if they don't want. So they don't have all the mechanisms they had before to negotiate with the government, but yet they still have to be part of the system. In other words, um, we still have unions that are not modern. Unions are still those that were useful to this organic government system. We need to modernize unions to make them of more use for workers. The role of unions now is still to serve government interests and not uh, workers' interests. But one said this, you don't have to have in mind that in Mexico workers have you know, a terrible day. Some unions were very, very spoiled by the, by, by the corporativist system and some uh, have benefits you could never imagine, like in some unions you can inherit your job. So I don't need to say more, but then you can see why, why I'm talking about modernizing unions to make them of some serve for economic uh, purposes. Uh, there are many things more that I'm not saying, but, but we can still talk through email if, if, if you guys feel like uh, and we can continue specific chats on the specific teams. Okay. 
Um, this, this, these are fabulous answers, and um, I, I can't imagine that you're making yourself very popular with some of your colleagues back home. <laughs> Uh, Alejandro, do you still have a, a taste and appetite for one more round of questions? We'll see if, if there are some other questions that uh, people would like to ask while you're online. Angela. Um, I thought the comment that you made... Could you speak louder, please? All right. I was wondering if you could elaborate on your point about cultural change and seeing NGOs as relevant actors in addition to the state rather than the state being the all-providing father, as you put it, and also maybe what NGOs are doing or what they could do to promote that cultural change. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Um, NAFTA has shifted the focus of employment in Mexico from the agricultural sector to the industrial sector. Uh, what effect has that had on CSOs in Mexico? Uh, NAFTA has had effect in reallocating the employment in Mexico from the agricultural sector to the industrial sector. What effect has that had on CSOs in Mexico? I will try to be brief. Uh, well, elaborate more on cultural change. Um, well, you have to imagine that after 72 years and when educational system was uh, controlled uh, practically totally by the state, uh, and the state control not only spaces of expression, but they allowed forms of expression so there were cultural forms of expression that were not allowed to exist. And um, for instance, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put some examples. Uh, the culture of accountability in Mexico didn't exist until 2000. And you could not imagine someone asking a politician uh, for give information on something. Sorry, we have a blockout here. Um, are you still seeing me? Yeah, yeah. we do actually. Did, did you listen to me? Yes, yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Oh, that's impressive because we have no technology here. So that should <laughs> must be magic or, or, or something. Uh, okay, well, so. Uh, <laughs> So that's what I'm saying, that we need a cultural change. We, we, don't, we used to do a lot of things through bribing and through corrupt mechanisms. Now we have to change that. And you can imagine that throughout 72 years, there are some generations that grow with, with this information in their minds and that this information is part of what they are. And Many things are still done through this in Mexico, and, and, and things are changing, but we need a faster change. That's what I mean by a cultural change. And we also need to rethink about, I said, about our, our history and value again the, the, the importance of our leaders, not because they were part of the government, but also to other leaders, as, as I talk about these civil society activists, that actually were central to the democracy we, we enjoy now. Uh, the other questions, NGOs are relevant actor now? Well, yes, uh, there are some NGOs that can be very, very influential. And there is a very interesting phenomenon going on in Mexico, and those of you that could be more interested, we can talk later on and, or chat about that. Um, practically, NGOs have gone into all areas. We had before very few NGOs. Now we have a number of NGOs similar to any other modern country. And 
the issues they are into are practically every single issue. You can find organizations for the preserving of uh, orchids, uh, while you also can find NGOs interested in indigenous rights or in cultural uh, preservation of, uh, you know, some patrimony of some city, historical heritage, and so on and so forth. So practically you find all type of NGOs now, and uh, some, I should say, are very well endowed. And, um, and some of them can be very influential. The major TV companies, we have two major TV companies in Mexico, both of them have their own foundation, and through their foundation, they have become really, really influential. And some of you that are interested can uh, surely ask Iker about Fundación Azteca or, or Teleton, which uh, have uh, managed to, to bring about impressive flow of resources from society. So yes, NGOs can be very, very relevant actors now. And for instance, some NGOs are setting the track to um, some ministries or some secretaries of government. For instance, we had already a Ministry of the Environment that came from NGOs. Uh, we had, uh, in, I think this is the second uh, Ministry of Health that comes from NGOs. So there you can see, just in these two examples, that they have not only uh, managed to shape public opinion, but have become so influential that the person that sees the most qualified person to go into this office comes from any specific NGOs of this I'm talking about. Um, finally, the effect of industrialization on civil society organizations. Well, you can see the effects in the topics they are interested in. And you can see that there are a number of organizations that are interested in economic issues like regional integration, free trade. You can also see that there are organizations that are interested in uh, workers' rights, uh, education for workers, and for, work, for, 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 for workers, children, and so on and so forth. So I would say that um, we didn't see maybe, if, if that was your question, an effect of industrialization like those we know that have happened in maybe some Asian or African countries because NGOs, when they were allowed to organize here, Mexico was already an industrialized country. But what you can see here are that the topics that are of interest to, the, to NGOs are topics indeed related to an industrialized country. Well, uh, as, as I said before, I'm not answering actually your questions, but if you have at the time uh, uh, to, to have a talk through the, through the mail, we can do that if you have specific issues you want to, to talk about. Okay, and uh, Alejandro has very generously left us his email address, and I have it if people didn't get a chance to uh, uh, take it down um, during class, so I can always provide it to you. Um, I would like to say thank you on behalf of um, Everybody here, Alejandro, it's just been really uh, remarkable to have someone as close to the uh, current situation in Mexico able to speak to us. Um, we don't give ICA uh, as much time as we've given you, so um, this has really been uh, very uh, valuable, I think, for all of us. And interesting, just to connect this discussion a little bit to um, some of our earlier uh, conversations about civil society in other parts of the world, um, we talked about civil society in uh, China uh, last week is an example of civil society trying to impact on public policy in a totalitarian context. And I would speak certainly for myself and probably for others in saying that it's really been insightful for me to hear you describe how, in fact, a, 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 a context that historically and politically you, you've described as authoritarian um, has managed to allow for uh, space for NGOs and the kind of impact they've had absolutely beyond serving their membership. I mean, I, there's nothing that I've heard you say today that is only about civil society organizations as 
serving members in a very narrow kind of way as welfare organizations or as charitable organizations, although many of them would have that as essential to their core responsibilities, but that the value of civil society organizations in Mexico has in fact been much larger, really impacting on democratization and the political culture in the country. So I think there are lots of really important lessons for us to draw from what you've shared with us this evening. Just, just to, to add to what you said, I really think that the Mexican case, as many others in the world show, that civil society is a, is a force, is a sometimes invisible force, that drop by drop can be very effective in promote democracy in the world. And donors in, in countries like Canada have to be very aware of this and of the importance of civil society action to actually create long term uh, cultural and democratic change in the world. And thank you all for listening to my broken and, and rusty English. I really appreciate uh, uh, that you actually had the patience to, to follow me uh, through this uh, also sometimes interrupted uh, a voice that gives us the, the technology. Thanks very much. Thank we'll you. We'll do this again sometime soon. Sure. Thank you. And sure. thank you to Frank who made it happen. <laughs> and thank you to the technicians at your end. Yes, thank you.